Chapter Twenty Two of The Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsty. The Red and the Black, Volume One by Stendhal, translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Twenty Two. Manners of Procedure in Eighteen Thirty speech has been given to man to conceal his thought r p malagrida julien had scarcely arrived at verrier before he reproached himself with his injustice towards madame de renal i should have despised her for a weakling of a woman if she had not had the strength to go through with her scene with monsieur de renal but she has acquitted herself like a diplomatist and i sympathize with the defeat of the man who is my enemy there is a bourgeois prejudice in my action. My vanity is offended because Monsieur de Renal is a man. Men form a vast and illustrious body to which I have the honour to belong. I am nothing but a fool. Monsieur Chelan had refused the magnificent apartments which the most important liberals in the district had offered him when his loss of living had necessitated his leaving the parsonage. The two rooms which he had rented were littered with his books. Julien, wishing to show Verrier what a priest could do, went and fetched a dozen pinewood planks from his father, carried them on his back all along the Grand Rue, borrowed some tools from an old comrade, and soon built a kind of bookcase in which he arranged Monsieur Chelon's books. "'I thought you were corrupted by the vanity of the world,' said the old man to him as he cried with joy, "'but this is something which well redeems all the childishness of that brilliant guard of honour uniform which has made you so many enemies.' Monsieur de Renal had ordered Julien to stay at his house. No one suspected what had taken place. The third day after his arrival, Julien saw no less a personage than Monsieur the sub-prefect de Moiron come all the way up the stairs to his room. It was only after two long hours of fatuous gossip and long-winded lamentations about the wickedness of man, the lack of honesty among the people entrusted with the administration of the public funds, the dangers of his poor France, etc., etc., that Julien was at last vouchsafed a glimpse of the object of the visit. They were already on the landing of the staircase, and the poor, half-disgraced tutor was escorting with all proper deference the future prefect of some prosperous department, when the latter was pleased to take an interest in Julien's fortune, to praise his moderation in money matters, etc., etc. Finally, Monsieur de Moron, embracing him in the most paternal way, proposed that he should leave Monsieur de Renal and enter the household of an official who had children to educate, and who, like King Philippe, thanked heaven not so much that they had been granted to him, but for the fact that they had been born in the same neighbourhood as Monsieur Julien. Their tutor would enjoy a salary of eight hundred francs, payable not from month to month, which is not at all aristocratic, said Monsieur de Moron, but quarterly and always in advance. It was Julien's turn now. After he had been bored for an hour and a half by waiting for what he had to say, his answer was perfect, and above all, as long as a bishop's charge. It suggested everything, and yet said nothing clearly. It showed at the same time respect for Monsieur de Renal, veneration for the public of Verrier, and gratitude to the distinguished sub-prefect. The sub-prefect, astonished at finding him more Jesuitical than himself, tried in vain to obtain something definite. Julien was delighted, seized the opportunity to practice, and started his answer all over again in different language. Never has an eloquent minister, who wished to make the most of the end of a session when the chamber really seemed desirous of waking up, said less in more words. Monsieur de Moron had scarcely left before Julien began to laugh like a madman. In order to exploit his Jesuitical smartness, he wrote a nine-page letter to Monsieur de Renal, in which he gave him an account of all that had been said to him, and humbly asked his advice. But the old scoundrel has not told me the name of the person who is making the offer. It is bound to be Monsieur Valenod, who, no doubt, sees in my exile at Verrier the result of his anonymous letter. Having sent off his dispatch, and feeling as satisfied as a hunter, who at six o'clock in the morning, on a fine autumn day, comes out into a plain that abounds with game, he went out to go and ask advice of Monsieur Chalon. 
but before he had arrived at the good cure's providence wishing to shower favours upon him threw in his path monsieur de valenod to whom he owed quite freely that his heart was torn in two a poor lad such as he was owed an exclusive devotion to the vocation to which it had pleased heaven to call him but vocation was not everything in this base world in order to work worthily at the vine of the lord and to not be totally unworthy of so many worthy colleagues it was necessary to be educated it was necessary to spend two expensive years at the seminary of besancon saving consequently became an imperative necessity and was certainly much easier with a salary of eight hundred francs paid quarterly than with six hundred francs which one received monthly on the other hand did not heaven by placing him by the side of the young duranals and especially by inspiring him with a special devotion to them seem to indicate that it was not proper to abandon that education for another one julian reached such a degree of perfection in that particular kind of eloquence which has succeeded the drastic quickness of the empire that he finished by boring himself with the sound of his own words on reaching home he found a valet of monsieur valenod in full livery who had been looking for him all over the town with a card inviting him to dinner for that same day julien had never been in that man's house only a few days before he had been thinking of nothing but the means of giving him a sound thrashing without getting into trouble with the police although the time of the dinner was one o'clock julien thought it was more deferential to present himself at half past twelve at the office of monsieur the director of the workhouse he found him parading his importance in the middle of a lot of dispatch boxes his large black whiskers his enormous quantity of hair his greek bonnet placed across the top of his head his immense pipe his embroidered slippers the big chains of gold crossed all over his breast and the whole stock in trade of a provincial financier who considers himself prosperous failed to impose on julien in the least they only made him think the more of the thrashing which he owed him he asked for the honour of being introduced to madame valenod she was dressing and was unable to receive him by way of compensation he had the privilege of witnessing the toilette of monsieur the director of the workhouse they subsequently went into the apartment of madame valenod who introduced her children to him with tears in her eyes this lady was one of the most important in verrieres had a big face like a man's on which she had put rouge in honour of this great function she displayed all the maternal pathos of which she was capable julien thought all the time of madame de renal his distrust made him only susceptible to those associations which are called up by their opposites but he was then affected to the verge of breaking down this tendency was increased by the sight of the house of the director of the workhouse he was shown over it everything in it was new and magnificent and he was told the price of every article of furniture but julien detected a certain element of sordidness which smacked of stolen money into the bargain everybody in it down to the servants had the air of setting his face in advance against contempt the collector of taxes the superintendent of indirect taxes the officer of gendarmerie and two or three other public officials arrived with their wives they were followed by some rich liberals dinner was announced it occurred to julien who was already feeling upset that there were some poor prisoners on the other side of the dining-room wall and that an illicit profit had perhaps been made over their rations of meat in order to purchase all that garish luxury with which they were trying to overwhelm him perhaps they are hungry at this very minute he said to himself he felt a choking in his throat he found it impossible to eat and almost impossible to speak matters became much worse a quarter of an hour afterwards they heard in the distance some refrains of a popular song that was it must be confessed a little vulgar which was being sung by one of the inmates monsieur valenod gave a look to one of his liveried servants who disappeared and soon there was no more singing to be heard at that moment a valet offered julien some rhine wine in a green glass and madame valenod made a point of asking him to note that this wine cost nine francs a bottle in the market julien held up his green glass and said to monsieur valenod they are not singing that wretched song any more zounds i should think not answered the triumphant governor 
I have made the rascals keep quiet. These words were too much for Julien. He had the manners of his new position, but he had not yet assimilated its spirit. In spite of all his hypocrisy and its frequent practice, he felt a big tear drip down his cheek. He tried to hide it in the green glass, but he found it absolutely impossible to do justice to the Rhine wine. Prevent singing, he said to himself. Oh, my God, and you suffer it. Fortunately, nobody noticed his ill-bred emotion. The collector of taxes had struck up a royalist song. So this, reflected Julien's conscience during the hubbub of the refrain which was sung in chorus, is the sordid prosperity which you will eventually reach. And you will only enjoy it under these conditions and in company like this. You will perhaps have a post worth twenty thousand francs, but while you gorge yourself on meat, you will have to prevent a poor prisoner from singing. You will give dinners with the money which you have stolen out of his miserable rations, and during your dinners he will be still more wretched. Oh, Napoleon, how sweet it was to climb to fortune in your way through the dangers of a battle, but to think of aggravating the pain of the unfortunate in this cowardly way. I own that the weakness which Julien had been manifesting in this soliloquy gives me a poor opinion of him. He is worthy of being the accomplice of those kid-gloved conspirators who purport to change the whole essence of a great country's existence without wishing to have on their conscience the most trivial scratch. Julien was sharply brought back to his role. He had not been invited to dine in such good company simply to moon dreamily and say nothing. A retired manufacturer of cotton prints, a corresponding member of the Academy of Besançon, and that of the Utsez spoke to him from the other end of the table, and asked him if what was said everywhere about his astonishing progress in the study of the New Testament was really true. A profound silence was suddenly inaugurated. A New Testament in Latin was found, as though by magic, in the possession of the learned member of the two academies. After Julien had answered, part of a sentence in Latin was read at random. Julien then recited, his memory proved faithful, and the prodigy was admired with all the boisterous energy of the end of dinner. Julien looked at the flushed faces of the ladies. A good many were not so plain. He recognised the wife of the collector, who was a fine singer. "'I am ashamed, as a matter of fact, to talk Latin so long before these ladies,' he said, turning his eyes on her. "'If Monsieur Rubineau,' that was the name of the member of the two academies, will be kind enough to read a Latin sentence at random instead of answering by following the Latin text, I will try to translate it in promptu. This second test completed his glory. Several liberals were there, who, though rich, were nonetheless the happy fathers of children, capable of obtaining scholarships, and had consequently been suddenly converted at the last mission. In spite of this diplomatic step, Monsieur de Renal had never been willing to receive them into his house. These worthy people, who only knew Julien by name, and from having seen him on a horseback on the day of the King of Blank's entry, were his most noisy admirers. When will those fools get tired of listening to this biblical language which they don't understand in the least, he thought. But on the contrary, that language amused them by its strangeness and made them smile. But Julien got tired. At six o'clock he got up gravely and talked about a chapter in Ligorio's new theology, which he had to learn by heart to recite on the following day to Monsieur Chelan. For, he added pleasantly, my business is to get lessons said by heart to me, and to say them by heart myself. There was much laughter and admiration, such is the kind of wit which is customary in Verrier. Julien had already got up, and in spite of etiquette, everybody got up as well, so great is the dominion exercised by genius. Madame Valenod kept him for another quarter of an hour. He really must hear her children recite their catechisms. They made the most absurd mistakes, which he alone noticed. He was careful not to point them out. What ignorance of the first principles of religion, he thought. Finally he bowed and thought he could get away, but they insisted on his trying a fable of La Fontaine. "'That author is quite immoral,' said Julien to Madame Valenod. 
a certain fable on monsieur jean chouart dares to pour ridicule on all that we hold most venerable he is shrewdly blamed by the best commentators before julien left he received four or five invitations to dinner this young man is an honour to the department cried all the guests in chorus they even went so far as to talk of a pension voted out of the municipal funds to put him in the position of continuing his studies at paris while this rash idea was resounding through the dining-room, Julien had swiftly reached the door. "'You scum! You scum!' he cried three or four times in succession in a low voice as he indulged in the pleasure of breathing in the fresh air. He felt quite an aristocrat at this moment, though he was the very man who had been shocked for so long a period by the haughty smile of disdainful superiority which he detected behind all the courtesies addressed to him at M. de Renal's. He could not help realising the extreme difference. Why, let us even forget the fact of its being money stolen from the poor inmates, he said to himself as he went away. Let us forget also their stopping the singing. Monsieur de Renal would never think of telling his guests the price of each bottle of wine with which he regales them. And as for this Monsieur Valenod, and his chronic cataloguing of his various belongings, he could not talk of his house, his estate, etc., in the presence of his wife without saying, your house your estate this lady who was apparently so keenly alive to the delights of decorum had just had an awful scene during the dinner with a servant who had broken a wine-glass and spoiled one of her dozens and the servant too had answered her back with the utmost insolence what a collection said julien to himself i would not live like they do were they to give me half of all they steal i should give myself away one fine day I should not be able to restrain myself from expressing the disgust with which they inspire one. It was necessary, however, to obey Madame de Renal's injunction and be present at several dinners of the same kind. Julien was the fashion. He was forgiven his guard of honour uniform, or rather, that indiscretion was the real cause of his successes. Soon the only question in Verrier was whether Monsieur de Renal or Monsieur the director of the workhouse would be the victor in the struggle for the clever young man. These gentlemen formed, together with Monsieur Maslon, a triumvirate which had tyrannised over the town for a number of years. People were jealous of the mayor, and the Liberals had good cause for complaint. But, after all, he was noble and born for a superior position, while Monsieur Valenod's father had not left him six hundred francs a year his career had necessitated a transition from pitying the shabby green suit which had been so notorious in his youth to envying the norman horses his gold chains his paris clothes his whole present prosperity julien thought that he had discovered one honest man in the whirlpool of this novel world he was a geometrist named gros and had the reputation of being a jacobin julien who had vowed to say nothing but that which he disbelieved himself was obliged to watch himself carefully when speaking to Monsieur Gros. He received big packets of exercises from Vergy. He was advised to visit his father frequently, and he fulfilled his unpleasant duty. In a word, he was patching his reputation together pretty well, when he was thoroughly surprised to find himself woken up one morning by two hands held over his eyes. It was Madame de Renal who had made a trip to the town, and who, running up the stairs four at a time while she left her children playing with a pet rabbit, had reached Julien's room a moment before her son's. This moment was delicious, but very short. Madame de Renal had disappeared when the children arrived with the rabbit, which they wanted to show their friend. Julien gave them all a hearty welcome, including the rabbit. He seemed at home again. He felt that he loved these children, and that he enjoyed gossiping with them. He was astonished at the sweetness of their voices, at the simplicity and dignity of their little ways. He felt he needed to purge his imagination of all the vulgar practices and all the unpleasantnesses amongst which he had been living in Verrier. For there everyone was always frightened of being scored off, and luxury and poverty were daggers drawn. The people with whom he would dine would enter into confidences over the joint which were as humiliating for themselves as they were nauseating to the hearer. "'You others, who are nobles, you are right to be proud,' he said to Madame de Renal, as he gave her an account of all the dinners which he had put up with. "'You're the fashion, then, 
and she laughed heartily as she thought of the rouge, which Madame Valenod thought herself obliged to put on each time she expected Julien. I think she has designs on your heart, she added. The breakfast was delicious. The presence of the children, though apparently embarrassing, increased, as a matter of fact, the happiness of the party. The poor children did not know how to give expression to the joy at seeing Julien again. The servants had not failed to tell them that he had been offered two hundred francs a year more to educate the little Valenods. Stanislas Xavier, who was still pale from his illness, suddenly asked his mother in the middle of the breakfast the value of his silver cover and of the goblet in which he was drinking. Why do you want to know that? I want to sell them to give the price to Monsieur Julien so that he shan't be done if he stays with us. Julien kissed him with tears in his eyes. His mother wept unrestrainedly, for Julien took Stanislas on his knees and explained to him that he should not use the word done, which, when employed in that meaning, was an expression only fit for the servants' hall. Seeing the pleasure which he was giving to Madame de Renal, he tried to explain the meaning of being done by picturesque illustrations, which amused the children. "'I understand,' said Stanislas. "'It's like the crow who is silly enough to let his cheese fall and be taken by the fox who has been playing the flatterer.' Madame de Renal felt mad with joy and covered her children with kisses, a process which involved her leaning a little on Julien. Suddenly the door opened. It was Monsieur de Renal. His severe and discontented expression contrasted strangely with the sweet joy which his presence dissipated. Madame de Renal grew pale. She felt herself incapable of denying anything. Julien seized command of the conversation, and commenced telling Monsieur the Mayor in a loud voice the incident of the silver goblet which Stanislas wanted to sell. He was quite certain this story would not be appreciated. Monsieur de Renal first of all frowned mechanically at the mere mention of money. Any allusion to that mineral, he was accustomed to say, is always a prelude to some demand made upon my purse. But this was something more than a mere money matter. His suspicions were increased. The air of happiness which animated his family during his absence was not calculated to smooth matters over with a man who was prey to so touchy a vanity. Yes, yes, he said, as his wife started to praise to him the combined grace and cleverness of the way in which Julien gave ideas to his pupils. I know, he renders me hateful to my own children. It is easy enough for him to make himself a hundred times more lovable to them than I am myself, though, after all, I am the master. In this century everything tends to make legitimate authority unpopular. Poor France! Madame de Renal had not stopped to examine the fine shades of the welcome which her husband gave her. She had just caught a glimpse of the possibility of spending twelve hours with Julien. She had a lot of purchases to make in the town, and declared that she positively insisted in going to dine at the tavern. She stuck to her idea in spite of all her husband's protests and remonstrances. The children were delighted with the mere word tavern, which our modern prudery denounces with so much gusto. Monsieur de Renal left his wife in the first draper's shop which she entered and went to pay some visits. He came back more morose than he had been in the morning. He was convinced that the whole town was busy with himself and Julien. As a matter of fact, no one had yet given him any inkling as to the more offensive part of the public gossip. Those items which had been repeated to Monsieur the Mayor dealt exclusively with the question of whether Julien would remain with him with six hundred francs or would accept the eight hundred francs offered by Monsieur the Director of the Workhouse. The Director, when he met Monsieur de Renal in society, gave him the cold shoulder. These tactics were not without cleverness. There is no impulsiveness in the provinces. Sensations are so rare there that they are never allowed to be wasted. Monsieur Le Valenod was what is called a hundred miles from Paris, a furrow. That means a coarse, imprudent type of man. His triumphant existence since 1815 had consolidated his natural qualities. He reigned, so to say, in Verrier, subject to the orders of Monsieur de Renal. But as he was much more energetic, was ashamed of nothing, had a finger in everything, and was always going about writing and speaking, and was oblivious of all snubs, he had, although without any personal pretensions, 
eventually come to equal the mayor in reputation in the eyes of the ecclesiastical authorities. Monsieur Valenod had, as it were, said to the local tradesmen, Give me the two biggest fools among your number. To the men of law, show me the two greatest dunces. To the sanitary officials, point out to me the two biggest charlatans. When he had thus collected the most impudent members of each separate calling, he had practically said to them, let us reign together. The manners of those people were offensive to Monsieur de Renal. The coarseness of Valenod took offence at nothing, not even the frequency with which the little Abbe Maslon would give the lie to him in public. But in the middle of all this prosperity, Monsieur Valenod found it necessary to reassure himself by a number of petty acts of insolence on the score of the crude truths which he well realised that everybody was justified in addressing to him. His activity had redoubled since the fears which the visit of Monsieur Appert had left him. He had made three journeys to Besançon. He wrote several letters by each courier. He sent others by unknown men who came to his house at nightfall. Perhaps he had been wrong in securing the dismissal of the old curé Chalon. For this piece of vindictiveness had resulted in his being considered an extremely malicious man by several pious women of good birth. Besides, the rendering of this service had placed him in absolute dependence on Monsieur the Grand Vicar de Frilair, from whom he received some strange commissions. He had reached this point in his intrigues when he had yielded to the pleasure of writing an anonymous letter and thus increasing his embarrassment. His wife declared to him that she wanted to have Julien in her house. Her vanity was intoxicated with the idea. Such being his position, M. Valenod imagined in advance a decisive scene with his old colleague M. de Renal. The latter might address to him some harsh words, which he would not mind much, but he might write to Besançon and even to Paris. Some minister's cousin might suddenly fall down on Verrier and take over the workhouse. Valenod thought of coming to terms with the Liberals. It was for that purpose that several of them had been invited to the dinner when Julien was present. He would have obtained powerful support against the mayor, but the elections might supervene, and it was only too evident that the directorship of the workhouse was inconsistent with voting on the wrong side. Madame de Renal had made a shrewd guess of this intrigue, and while she explained it to Julien, as he gave her his arm to pass from one shop to another, they found themselves gradually taken as far as the Cour de la Fidelité, where they spent several hours nearly as tranquil as those at Vergy. At the same time, M. Valenod was trying to put off a definite crisis with his old patron by himself assuming the aggressive. These tactics succeeded on this particular day, but aggravated the mayor's bad temper. Never has vanity at close grips with all the harshness and meanness of a pettifogging love of money reduced a man to a more sorry condition than that of Monsieur de Renal when he entered the tavern. The children, on the other hand, had never been more joyful and more merry. This contrast put the finishing touch on his peak. "'So far as I can see, I am not wanted in my family,' he said as he entered in a tone which he meant to be impressive. For answer, his wife took him on one side and declared that it was essential to send Julien away. The hours of happiness which she had just enjoyed had given her again the ease and firmness of demeanour necessary to follow out the plan of campaign which she had been hatching for a fortnight. The finishing touch to the trouble of the poor mayor of Verrier was the fact that he knew that they joked publicly in the town about his love for cash. Valenod was as generous as a thief, and on his side had acquitted himself brilliantly in the last five or six collections for the Brotherhood of St. Joseph, the Congregation of the Virgin, the Congregation of the Holy Sacrament, etc., etc. Monsieur de Renal's name had been seen more than once at the bottom of the list of gentlefolk of Verrier, and the surrounding neighbourhood, who were adroitly classified in the list of the collecting brethren according to the amount of their offerings. It was in vain that he said that he was not making money. The clergy stands no nonsense in such matters. End of chapter 22